Um, Sugal Tubia is, is an MD, he was raised in Lebanon, he studied uh, medical school in, uh, in Brussels in Belgium. Um, did his residency in California, he practiced medicine until 98, and since then he's been involved with several medical device companies uh, in general manufacturing. Uh, he's been in California since 1980. Um, he's involved with the, the ADC and the Arab American University graduates a number of other uh, projects. He's been very supportive of the Levantine program. He's one of the sponsors for tonight. He's agreed to uh, take Sari Magnus's place because he's read um, uh, the book, uh, General Sun, by um, Miko Pellet. And Miko Pellet is, um, is uh, originally born and raised in Israel. His grandfather was one of the founding uh, Zionists, and his father was a famous general. And Miko himself was in the, uh, I believe, Special Forces. Uh, but at some point, he <clears throat> had a change of heart after getting to know Palestinians. Um, and he'll tell you more about that himself. Um, very proud to be able to bring him back to uh, 11 Team program and that he's agreed to be part of our organization as well. So let's bring up Dr. Suhal Tubia and Miko Pellin. Good evening. Uh, it's a big and tall order to take the place of Sari Magdisi. I have great admiration for him to be put in this position and to fill in. It's um, quite stressful for me, so bear with me. Not only that, it's, I had to uh, really, uh, though I've read uh, Miko's uh, book, and I had to read it again and to be able to be able to be prepared. And I think I did prepare myself. So well, where I'm going to start, and I don't know if any one of you had seen the book, and I encourage every one of you to read this book. It's a, it's a must. Uh, called the General Sun: Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. And um, though the book talks quite a bit and it has about two of the chapters that address the issue of a major tragic event that really affected Nico's life, his whole family, his whole entourage and friends, and uh, to a, uh, in my opinion, to a better position. I'll let him talk about that, of course. And that happened in 1997. We'll get to that in a few moments. But I believe what happened in Nico's journey that started way back with his parents. The first one, I believe, it started in 1948 during the, the Nakba, the catastrophe. And uh, I'm going to start with two major actors in his life, his mom and his dad. First, his mom, Zika, who I assume and I can understand from reading about her, she was a very important person as a human being. So let me start with the actor number one, your mom, Zika. In 1948, the catastrophe took place, Palestinians are being displaced, and here Jewish families are being invited to, to take some homes that are Palestinian homes. His mother had a hard time accepting the fact, though a big and beautiful home was offered to, to the family, and she refused. Could you please take it from there, Miko? Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Well, thank you. I just want to say before I answer the question, uh, thank you all for being here. And I really admire uh, Jordan and his vision for the center, so I really I really hope it materializes and materializes soon. I think it's uh, I think it's going to serve a very very important purpose, and there's a real there's a real need for this right now. 
And so I'm really glad that this is here. And I'm seeing a lot of people here today that I saw at the event a few months ago. So thank you all for coming back. You've heard me once. You're back to hear me again. That's a good sign. So thank you all. And I know several people have, have, uh, have the book and read it. And I've heard some very kind comments. So thank you all for that. Um, the, the point, and thank you so very much for doing this. Um, he's really studied the book well to be able to, to, to do this this evening. So thank you. I appreciate it. The, um, it's an interesting thing growing up as an Israeli because, of course, you're taught a certain narrative that justifies everything that, Israeli, that Israel does from 1948 all the way to the present. And the Israeli, the Israeli Zionist education system is built in a way that really justifies, starts from the very beginning and lays out, lays out uh, certain principles certain visions that are really powerful. And whether you grow up in Israel and you, and you receive it there, or whether you grow up here in the US, whether you're Jewish or not, but you receive it here as well, and I can see that when I speak to people here in the US, you receive the same vision, the same, the same ideas about Israel and how Israel was created. And the basic foundation of this vision is the David and Goliath picture. Somehow, at every point, at every conflict, at every, every um, major event where Israel and either the Palestinians or other Arabs in, in the Middle East are involved, it's always David and Goliath. Israel is always David, and the others are always Goliath. And even though Israel is always weaker and smaller, somehow, miraculously, they always they always not only survive, but they manage to conquer lands and, and do all these miraculous things and destroy all these different armies everywhere and come out on top. And once this principle was uh, is instilled, then it's really easy to explain everything. And it's really easy to justify everything, which is even more dangerous. Now, the story that I learned, just like any other Israeli, about 1948, for example, which we Israelis call the War of Independence, the story that we learned was that there was a small... Jewish community that was just beginning to develop into a state in what we call Eretz Israel, which is of course Palestine. And really for no reason at all other than, their, than, than deep hatred, the Arab countries and the Arabs all around, not only the Arab countries, but the Arabs all around within Palestine decided to attack and destroy this Jewish community. And somehow miraculously, because we were smarter and we were more motivated and we were somehow morally uh, more justified, we not only survived, but we defeated them. Now this is a story that I grew up on. And my father was an officer, he was a young officer in the Israeli forces, or the Zionist forces at those times. It wasn't an army yet, there wasn't an Israel yet. We're talking about the end of 1947. But at the same time that I was learning this in school and from the environment and so on, there was a story that my mother told me that somehow um, contradicted that in a very small way, but a very annoying way. It was always in the back of my head. It didn't sit well with the national narrative. This was a small personal narrative that didn't sit with the national narrative. And it wasn't actually until I was working on the book that I managed to figure it out. And the story was, she was living in Jerusalem in her mother's apartment. My mother was born, both my parents were born in Palestine. And my mother was born in Jerusalem and she was living in a small apartment with her mother and my two older siblings. And my father was, of course, in the front uh, fighting for the, for the Zionist cause. And then when the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, of West Jerusalem, were what they called, what the Zionists called, cleansed from their, from their uh, residents, from their Palestinian inhabitants, they were cleansed, um, these homes became available. And if you've been to Jerusalem, and every time I give this presentation, there's always at least one person in the audience that, that had a home there, or belongs to a family that had a home there. But if you've been to Jerusalem, you know these are very distinctive homes. They're still there. Many of them are occupied. Some of them are not occupied. Some of them are empty. Some of them have become restaurants and stores and so on. But they're very distinct, very beautiful homes with a large garden in front and so on. And she remembers as a child, and she told me this, I, I spoke to her a lot, of course, as I was working on the book. And she told me that she recalls as a child walking through on a weekend, 
through these neighborhoods and seeing a family sitting in the yard under the lemon tree and so on. And then one day, these families are forced to leave. And she's 22 years old, living in a small apartment with her mother, her mother, who there's no picnics living with her mother, let me tell you. And she's offered this beautiful home for free. And she couldn't do it. She said, how can I possibly take the home of another mother? How can I take the home of a family that was forced to leave and now they are refugees somewhere? And I remember, I don't remember how old I was when she told me the story for the first time, but I remember that I've known it my entire life. And this story sits, it, it, it doesn't reconcile with the national narrative. The national narrative is that the Arabs of Israel, what Israel, what the Zionists call the Palestinians, the Arab of Israel left. They weren't forced to leave, they left. Well, if they left, then what is the story about the house and why was it a problem for her? And again, like I said, it wasn't until I actually worked on the book that I spoke to her about this again and again and again, and I finally realized what the issue was. This was her little story, her little personal narrative, really destroyed the entire national narrative because it stood, it stood in the face of that, of that bigger narrative. And, and that was really my first inclination that there was a Nakba, that there was an injustice, that something was wrong. And she would talk about the truckloads, the Israeli truckloads, driving away with the loot, with the furniture and the rugs. These were beautiful homes and they were giving away to the families and everything was taken. Um, so this was, like I said, this was, this was really my first encounter with, um, with the fact that there was an injustice. It wasn't until later on that I learned more about it. But that's, that was the seed, that was how it began. The second event is in 1955, and this involves your father, Matty, who fought during the independence war, as called by Israel, and the Nakba, as called by the Palestinians. In 1955, there was a big war going on between Moshe Sharet and Ben Gurion, and they were they kept trading the prime minister and foreign minister, and finally Ben Gurion prevailed and he fired Sharet, and as a result, it was the Sinai campaign. It was an agreement between. UK, France, and Israel to attack Egypt. And, and by Ben Gurion prevailing, and the invasion of Gaza and the Sinai took place. That was the first invasion of Gaza. As a result, your father, Manny, was appointed as the military government of the uh, Sinai and Gaza. Could you tell us? about was this the first turning event in your father's life that made him change his opinion about what was happening about his Zionist dream about the future and we'll talk later on about what happened in 1967. Sure. Yes, the, the, um, the internal politics inside Israel, the internal Zionist politics were always interesting. Like any national movement, Zionism evolved. And at every turning point, or I should say, at every intersection, the decision and the choice by the, by the leaders of, of the Zionist movement at the time was always towards war and away from peace. The strategy of the Zionist leaders were all, was always, was always um, towards war, it was always to, to, to pursue war instead of pursuing peace. This was from the very, very beginning. And um, of course, my father was a, well, he was born there, and this is this was the education that he received. So he were justified this. He joined the Haganah, you know, the Jewish militia, and so on. And then he remained as an officer when Israel became a state, and these militias became the Israeli army. And then um, within within the Zionist movement inside Israel, within the Israeli government, there was some conflict of whether or not Zionism should maintain this very aggressive very radical stance and always pursue war, or whether or not this was time once the state of Israel was established to actually try to make peace with its neighbors. And the two most, the, the, the two leaders of these two groups were Ben Gurion, who was very violent, very radical, 
wanted to fly all the time, develop the army. And Moshe Sharet, who was more kind of a moderate, he said, well, now we have our state. We have a Jewish majority in this country. We got rid of the local Arabs, to most of them. Now maybe we can make peace. So this was the two. Uh, these were the two things, and Ben Gurion and the military and the leaders and the, the generals in the Israeli army wanted another war. They wanted to attack Egypt, and this 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 little this tug of war was going on, pretty powerful. It was a pretty powerful tug of war that was going on within the Israeli government. Finally, Ben Gurion prevailed, of course, because he was stronger and he had the support of the army. He fired Charette, um, and he, he and. <coughs> Moshe Dayan, I'm sure many of you heard of, who was chief of staff at the time, decided that they were going to go ahead and pursue this war. And this was right after Nasser had uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. And so, of course, the, the British and the French were very angry, and they thought Israel would be a good, uh, a good way to, you know, to bring Israel in would be a good thing, and they started the war. But as leading up to the war, they started justifying the need for war. And there's a very speech that was made by Dayan just before the war, explaining how, this is very interesting, this is 1955, he was explaining how these refugees in Gaza, from whom we took the land, and this is the language that he used, from which we took the land, are now looking at us from Gaza as we cultivate the land and as we build a homeland for ourselves on their land. And again, this is Moshe Dayan's language. And they are ready at any moment to kill us and destroy us because they want their land back. Now, if you know anything about the refugees in Gaza, you know that there was no, there was no ability for them to kill and destroy anybody or anything because they were poor refugees. And um, from time to time, they would try to go back to their homes and get food or to their fields or do something. Uh, but this was the myth that was perpetuated, and of course, that was how they justified the war. Again, with, Brit with, with the British and the, and the French, they began the, what they was called the Sinai Campaign, and within five days, they destroyed the Egyptian army, took the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, and my father became the military governor of Gaza. And this was his first encounter with Palestinians. Now, he was born in Palestine, 1923. But this was his real first encounter. And he, when he received his orders to become the military governor, as he read his orders, he suddenly realized his position as overlord of these people who he just conquered. Now, when he joined the Jewish militia, the Haganah, that was to fight the British who were occupying, you know, our country. What he perceived as our country. Now, he's in the position of the, as the British were, but now he's in that same position in relation to the Palestinians. And suddenly he realized he had no tools to do, to do this. He, he didn't speak the language. He didn't know anything about the culture. He needed a translator in order to deal with people. And he didn't see that threat that everybody was talking about. He didn't see the, the, the desire to kill Jews and to murder Israelis and the Palestinians at all. He said they, were, they, were, they, they wanted compromise. They wanted to make peace. They wanted us all to live together. They, wanted, they didn't want to go back to Egypt. And his sense was that there was, a, that there was a need here to learn about, about these people. So the first thing he did was he began studying Arabic. Later on, he ended up teaching Arabic literature at Tel Aviv University. He became, Arabic became his second career. But he began studying Arabic, and he began a, a dialogue with the Palestinian leadership, and he began, and he wrote this, you know, a, a report that's considered quite well, quite well known. It's called the Gaza Report, which was the first time that anything that has to do with Gaza was actually written down. The number of people, where they came from, which towns the refugees came from, which families came, and so on and so forth. I mean, everything to livestock, I mean, every detail about Gaza. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, but he, he sensed that there was a need to understand and to, to work with these people because we share a land, this land that we, the Jews, decided, that we, the Zionists, I should say, decided was our own. There are other people living here, so we need to have some common ground. We need to be able to talk to them. And that was, because people always say, how was it that after he retired from the military, I'm sure we'll touch on that later, once he retired from the military, he became an advocate for Palestinian rights, both within Israel and for Palestinian rights to self-determination in the West Bank and Gaza. So what happened to the general who suddenly became a peace? And so people kind of, we always go back and try to figure out well, when was it? And he said that this was the first opportunity he had to really realize 
that there's a depth of culture, that there's a language, that there are all these things that we can learn about and, and, and perhaps be able to share this land uh, one day. So certainly that was really a turning point in his, in his life and in his career. Was it fair to assume that in the Gaza report also there was a plan not to allow the people of Gaza and the Sinai to go back to the land? Or is that... To go back to the land in Saint Palestine? Yes. Yeah, well, Israel had already once... Israel did something very interesting. You know, once, um, once the Nakba was completed, and once Israel had forcibly exiled you know, the vast majority of Palestinians from within, what they wanted within what they call these, you know, the state of Israel. Then they passed laws that allowed the state to take their land and forbade the refugees from returning. So it was against the law for refugees to return. Um, so there was no way for the refugees to return. And what happened is, from time to time, they would try to come back, and that's when Israel would retaliate, and that's when uh, the famous, the infamous Unit 101, which was led by Ariel Sharon, a unit of assassins, really would go into Gaza would go into towns in the West Bank or sometimes across the Jordan River and, uh, and massacre Palestinians because they dared to, from time to time, try to, what they call, infiltrate back to their homes. Um, but one of the biggest frustrations that my father had within, as a result of this position that he had, was that he was authorized to tell the Palestinians in Gaza that if they cooperated, they would not be returned to, to the Egyptians. That if they cooperated, they would be somehow allowed some kind of an independence, some kind of an autonomy. They would not be returned. And he describes very vividly in an article that he wrote many years later, and I quote in the book, the meeting that he had to have with the local leaders in Gaza when he told them that the Jewish state, Zionist state, was going back on its word. And that indeed they will be returned to Egypt. And he describes the, the silence in the room and the looks of disbelief that the Zionist state, that the state of Israel would deceive them like that. And his own feeling of, you know, helplessness where, you know, he was told he could promise one thing and then he was ordered to say the opposite. And these are, this is a life and death thing because they knew that having cooperated or, or not fought the Israeli occupation, uh, they would be punished by the Egyptians. Uh, and that was his very first frustration. Later on, many years later, he wrote about why is it that there's a serious trust issue. He said, well, we have, the reason there's a trust issue is because we have already misled the Palestinians once before. And I was the one to deliver the message saying that we have misled you. Um, and so this thing came up, came up many, many times in his career later on, both in the military and, and, um, and as a peace activist. Now, let's go to the major event in your book so the audience can understand what triggered your journey, which seems like it started in 1997, on September 4th. You were watching the news on CNN, and there is a bomb, a suicide bomb in Jerusalem. And you see this young girl laying on a stretcher. So, you had that feeling that this is somebody that might be related to you. You got you call home and your niece is missing, but nobody knows where she was. Um, you try to brush off the idea and not to think about it. And I'm sorry to take you back to that day. Um, and nothing has been confirmed about what's going on, why, this Madar was, was missing. So you go to work, you, on your way, you call a friend of yours to see if you can buy a ticket in a short period of time to go back home in case. So you have that in the back of your mind. Unfortunately, that night, the news was confirmed and your niece was killed in that event. And the two bombers were killed too. Your passport was, uh, was expired, and that was an issue, and you, you needed to fly right away. The consulate accommodated you, and they gave you an, uh, they renewed your passport. Needless to say, the flight was very sad. 
your brother picked you up at the airport and um, here you go to your sister's house and you go up the stairs and you meet her. Tell us what happened. You know, it's interesting. So Helen and I stood outside earlier and we went over this. And we went over this, both of us had tears in our eyes. <laughs> Um, I mean, how do you describe something like this? How do you describe the feeling when a 13-year-old girl that you know, that you love, is suddenly killed? How do you make sense of it? How do you go back to life afterwards? I mean, this is, this is such a difficult and such a powerful and overwhelming emotion. Um, and I have to say that the reason both I and other, separate, and other family members of mine were able to um, move, up, move on was my sister's, Madara's mother. So like Sahel described, this was what happened, you know, I, I, you know, I, I see the event on the, as I was watching CNN, my mother calls, she goes, well, Madara's missing, we don't know where she is. So of course you brush it off, she's at a friend's house, you know, I remember what it's like, you're in Jerusalem, a bomb, a bomb goes off, you're in a friend's house, you don't think to call. Uh, but of course by the end of the day it was confirmed, and by then I'd already called a friend of mine who was a travel agent and, and, and got myself a ticket just in case. Um, and then my brother picks me up at the airport, I go up the steps, and I meet my sister, and of course we fall into each other's arms and we, we cry like, uh, like babies. And then that day was the funeral. They waited, you know, Jews, like Muslims, we bury our, the dead 24, after 24 hours, but they waited for me to, to get there. Um, and the funeral was that day. Then after the funeral, you know, Jews, we have the seven days of mourning, the Shiva, and the apartment, and that's the house that I was born in, by the way, my sister lived there. And, uh, it was not a big apartment, but it was packed with people. Because she was the granddaughter of a famous general and a man who later on became what they called Mr. Peace with Palestine. And, you know, and they wanted to say, we'll see what they did to him now. Like, it didn't do him any good. This was kind of the, this was the, this was the atmosphere. And reporters were there and so on and so forth. Well, when my sister finally came out to face everybody, she said two things that put us all on a path. A path that kept us sane and a path that kept me looking for something to do about this. And she said two very clear things. She was asked about retaliation, which is of course the first thing reporters ask. Retaliation, revenge. And she said, no real mother would want to see the same thing happen to any other mother. <laughs> Motherhood being a uniting, a uniting power, so to speak. You know, motherhood is something that goes beyond nationality or religion. And if there's one thing my sister is above everything, is she is a mother. She has three other boys. Um, so that was her first statement. So don't, you know, don't ask me all these stupid questions about retaliation. You know, this is not, this is not what we're talking about here. Number two, she said, we need to look at what drove two young men to blow themselves up, to take away their own life, and take away the life of my, my niece and several other Israelis were killed. What is it, what kind of despair, what kind of hopelessness did we, the Israelis, bring upon these two young men that they could take their own lives and take the lives of other innocent people? Can you imagine the level of despair? Can you imagine the level of hopelessness? This is what occupation and oppression does to people. And I point my finger, she said, at my government for allowing this to happen. And these two things, number one, created even more, you know, of a story and more news cast came in the New York Times and the LA Times and everybody, the, everybody came to talk to her, of course. But this put us all on a path, you know, to kind of clarify to us where we stood and where this was going to go. And, um, you know, she's been very active and very vocal ever since. And it's not to say that it made it easy, but it, you know, it kind of clarified and crystallized to all of us what was going on. And an interesting side story, which I talk about in the book as well, 
Bibi Netanyahu, who is now Prime Minister, was Prime Minister then as well. And Bibi grew up in our neighborhood, and he and my sister went to school together. He used to, I used to, he used to come to our house. I remember when he joined the military. You know, his first wife was still my sister's best friend. I mean, this was, was very close in the neighborhood. Um, so there's another little side story there because he came, he called and asked if he was welcome to come. And she said, no, you're not welcome to come visit. Don't come. And he never did. Um, but this was, uh, this was that moment and this was how we kind of survived, you know, from that moment on, the seven days of mourning and then, and then beyond that. While we're talking about the seven days of mourning, <clears throat> on the plane, on your way to back to Israel, you were engulfed by terrible thoughts. You were hoping that the suicide bombers were killed, though you knew that they, they had died. But that was your sense of thinking. You, you weren't thinking straight. And then you, you wondered, how could there be possibly be vengeance for a death like this? Now, during the week of mourning, Ehud Barak was at your sister's house uh, presenting his condolences and he started talking about that he was running to be the prime minister as the replacement of uh, Isaac Rabin who was assassinated the year prior, uh, two years prior to that and he was going to be the leader for peace but he said that I cannot talk peace during my campaign because that will not get me a lot of votes. What was your reaction to that? As Israeli politicians have this very cynical habit, whenever there's a disaster like this, they come to, you know, to, to, to um, offer their condolences. Never mind the fact that in many of the cases they were the cause for these disasters. Um, and El Barak was this, uh, you know, after Rabin was assassinated, everybody thought El Barak was going to be his predecessor, which he really was. They were both made of the same material, they were both generals, and they were both murderers. Uh, but at that time, there was some kind of a hope that perhaps Barak would opt for peace. And as he sat in the room, and it was a small room, but filled with people, he talked about the need for peace and so on and so forth, but of course, as somebody, in order, to, in order to be able to get the votes, he can't really talk about peace. He can't really talk about the fact that there need to be concessions, and you can't talk about a Palestinian state, and you can't talk about the rights of Palestinians, because then he might lose votes. And I thought, well, here we are sitting in this, in this, in this really horrible situation, and this is the best he can do. So I said to him, what are you talking about? Why don't you just tell people the truth? This happens because of the occupation. We want this to end, we have to end the occupation. We have to allow the Palestinians the rights. Just tell people the truth. How long can we go on with this nonsense? But, you know, he gave me a cold look, and, and, and that was the end of it. Of course, he didn't, he didn't answer or anything. And later on, one of his uh, guys came up to me and said, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand how this works, you know, and all that stuff. Um, and then when he got up to leave, you know, he went and shook everybody's hands, but he kind of ignored me. Which is fine, and then of course it turned out that he was just as just as bloodthirsty and just as murderous as, as every other Israeli prime minister, and had no intentions of ever ever making peace with anybody. So it was it was a bluff to begin with. So to go back to the beginning of your journey, so it's fair to assume it started in '97 on September 4th, though you did not react to that and you did not take any action until later on in 2000. But no question about it, you, you talk about this event, about two chapters in the book. And it was a ma major turning point for you and several family members. Your sister Nurit, your brother-in-law Rami, your mother. And in 97, the conflict became personal to you. Up until then, it was not personal, it was happening to everybody else but you. Until 1997, you were not involved in any politics or any activism. You mentioned that her death pushed you into a bold examination of your Zionist beliefs, your country's history, and the political situation that 
fuel the suicide bombers who killed Smadar. After her death, you wanted to meet people on the other side, the enemy. You were 39 and you were living in Southern California, never had a Palestinian friend before. You reached out to Jewish Palestinian dialogue group in San Diego. You contacted ADC, ADC referred you to George Puri. You met, your wife was very scared, and she said, be careful, I don't trust what you're about to do. And then you say, now I faced Palestinians during the meeting with the first meeting with Palestinians. And you say, now I faced Palestinians as equals for the first time in my life. And to my relief and amazement, I found common ground. And allow me to read a little bit here from your book. And you say, however, Palestinians told a different version of our history than I had been taught as a young boy in Jerusalem. The history I knew painted Israel as a defenseless David fighting an Arab Goliath, a story that had compelled me as a young patriot to volunteer for an elite commando unit in the Israel Defense Forces. Sitting across from Palestinians in California, I learned of mass expulsions, massacres, and grave injustice. We proudly called the 1948 Arab-Israeli War the War of Independence. Palestinians called it the Nakba, the catastrophe. I found that hard to accept. Why all of a sudden you felt that the Palestinians were equal? And how did you feel about them prior to that event and meeting them face to face? Um, yeah, that was, a, that was quite a turning point. I always tell people, if you're going to have any kind of major turning point, then uh, it's nice to have Palestinians around. The, <laughs> I think because, you know, coming from where I did, you know, I was right. My side was right. Yes, there were problems, we didn't do everything right, we made mistakes, but basically and fundamentally, we were right. And what I learned was suddenly that, no, we weren't right. And the process by which you learn that your own side is, is wrong is so painful it's like having a tooth pulled out without anesthesia. It's unbelievably painful. And the group that I was with, there were, you know, it was a Jewish Palestinian group, but, but the Palestinians were the ones that really delivered the bad news, <laughs> so to speak. You know, I couldn't have wished, I couldn't have hoped, I couldn't have imagined a more supportive environment in which to learn this, a more understanding environment in which to learn this. You'd think these were people who were experts in some kind of group therapy or something. It was a very difficult process, but it was done in a way that it didn't kill me. Although emotionally, it could kill you. This is very, very powerful. Especially coming where I did. You know, my grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence. You know, Israel was, was in my blood. Being an Israeli was part of who I am, and a Zionist, not just an Israeli. Um, and, uh, but the thing is with Israel is that it's completely segregated. So if you've been there, you know. I mean, it's completely segregated. One of the most, uh, I think, crowning achievements of Zionism is the segregation that exists there, while at the same time pretending it's a democracy. It's one of the myths I talk about. There's a myth that Israel is somehow a democracy. Israel is not a democracy. Israel is a very, very segregated place. And because it's so segregated, and because the segregation is so successful, Israelis never meet Palestinians. I mean, they see them in the market, they see them doing, uh, you know, landscaping. But you don't see, you never meet Palestinians. The first time I met Palestinians in an environment where we were completely equal, so they didn't need anything from Israelis. They didn't need a permit, they didn't have to meet a time because of a curfew. They didn't, you know, they didn't need to go back to some, you know, place that was, you know, surrounded by soldiers. We were completely, you know, we finished talking and eating and everybody got in their cars and went home. Was here in the United States, in San Diego. I was 39 years old. Now, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. Supposedly, as we heard 
you know, united and eternal and so on, right? Um, and mixed, it is mixed. It is, I suppose, united if, you're, if you look at the Zionist point of view. But it's completely, completely segregated and completely undemocratic, but that's another issue. So here I was for the first time, and it was, it was liberating. Like I said, it was difficult, but it was liberating in many, many ways. And when the bad news came out, you know, this was a dialogue group. So the purpose of the dialogue group was not to argue and to point fingers and to accuse each other. The dialogue group was, a, you know, was, we all came from a place that you tell your story. And I'm looking at people that I've grown to like and, and trust, and you know, we had, we had a very, it was a very, very pleasant dialogue group, very active group of people. And they're telling me sto hair-raising stories about soldiers in the Israeli army, about massacres, about, about expulsions, about violence. Israelis don't do these things. Israelis don't do these things, you know? Now, many Israelis and Jewish people, American Jews, would come and leave. I mean, they would say to me, how can you sit with these extremists? I said, what extremist? What are you talking about? But it was very hard. It was impossible for them to accept to hear this. Um, and eventually, we came to a point where we were sitting in a meeting once, and we did talk about 1948 and what actually happened in 1948. And I, uh, it was hair-raising. I couldn't believe I was hearing these people say, these very intelligent, educated, sensible people saying these things. It was diametrically opposed to what I knew to be true, not what I thought was true. And, but I couldn't discount them. I couldn't say, well, they're anti-Semites, they're racist, they're terrorists, and all that. I couldn't say that they weren't. So I went home one night and I called my brother. My brother Yoav is a professor of political science at Tel Aviv University. I called him up and I said, look, I'm sitting with these people, the Palestinians, and they're telling me all these stories. Is there any, is there, I mean, is there anything in what they say that might be true? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, yes. And what you need to do now is go read Ilan Pape. And go read Dami Schleim. And some of these Israeli, Israeli historians that about 15, 20 years ago, so maybe 15, like 15, uh, went and rewrote the history of 1948 and rewrote the history of the Israeli-Palestinian relations. So that's what I did. I went to you know, I went to the library and I took I got all their books and I read them all. And that was my revelation. And again, going through this process, which is very difficult, and very painful. I was fortunate that I had a, a support group that were these people. There were these Palestinians who I think realized where I was coming from and kind of helped me. Help me along the way so I won't lose my mind in the process. Let's go to the next major player in your life, your sister Nurit. How did she get to the point, writing in the New York Times, stating about Netanyahu, and I quote, sacrificed our children for their megalomania, for their need to control, oppress, and dominate? What was her accusations to the hawkish politicians? And tell us about the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought that she received from the European Parliament along with Isad Ghazawi, Palestinian writer and peace activist. How was the ceremony that you attended with your son, Itan? Yeah, these, these are the kinds of words, this is exactly how my, my sister speaks. She, people, people are so shocked when she talks that it's, you know, everybody goes, what did she just say? And then the New York Times and everybody shows up again just to make sure they heard well because she talks about, you know, in America especially, but in the West as well, in Western Europe too, Israeli leaders are considered, you know, as, you know, leaders of a democracy and leaders of a country that respects human rights and part of the Western civilization. And here is this mother who just lost her daughter and she's calling them bloodthirsty megalomaniacs. She's talking about Netanyahu and Barack the way Americans talk about Saddam Hussein. And they just couldn't get their ha head around it. So there were more interviews and so on and so forth that she was invited to speak. And, um, and, and this was her message. Stop these people. They are not, they're, they're not leaders of democracy. They are not leaders of, they don't respect human rights. My daughter's, my daughter's death uh, was horrific enough the death would, my, would worse be suffered with my daughter's death. Palestinians are suffering every single day for the last 60 years. There are thousands and thousands of Palestinian mothers who are suffering this. The world has to hear this and you have to stop this. You have to stop these people. And mind you, this has been going on. She's been doing this for 15 years. And then, um, 
At one point, she received the notice that the European Parliament was going to award her and Isad Ghazawi, uh, a very well-known Palestinian writer and, and human rights activist who sat in prison, the Israelis imprisoned him many, many, many times, and then they shot his son in, in high school, uh, I believe he lived in Hebron. Um, and he continued on the same vein of peace activism and, and reaching out to Israelis and so on, and then they received the Sakharov Prize jointly. And when we were, this was 2001, this was December 2001, it was right after 9-11. Um, and so we just had our second son, so Gila couldn't come, and of course he was a baby, so I took Eitan, my, um, my older son, um, and we flew to Paris with the family there, and then we took the train to Strasbourg, and my sister invited um, a very special woman, the widow of uh, Issam Sartawi. Issam Sartawi was a very important Palestinian leader. He was, a, he was a PLO representative in Paris for many, many years. And he was assassinated in Portugal in 1981, I believe. Um, and he was my father's peace partner when they began this dialogue, that my father began and initiated a dialogue with the PLO. Um, and so she invited, uh, she was also a doctor, they were both doctors, Dr. Uh, uh, Sartawi, to come with us, and she dedicated her prize to uh, Isam Sartawi, my father, at, the, at that event. And when she spoke, there was not a single dry eye in the audience. You know, it was a very, very, very moving event. Uh, and of course, the recognition, and, and the Israeli embassy, well, all the Israeli embassies in Europe tried to do everything they could so that she would not get the prize. But the president of the, of the, of the European Parliament at the time insisted and she awarded her the award. The next person in your life is your brother-in-law, Rami. During the week of mourning, a gentleman by the name of Itzhak Frankenthal, the founder of the Bereaved Families Forum, founded in 1994 after the killing of his son, showed up in the morning. And your brother-in-law was very furious, and he told him, how dare you walk into the house of someone who just lost a child and talk about peace and reconciliation? Where do you get the nerve to do that? And in your book, your brother-in-law changed totally, and he joined that group, the Bereaved Families Forum. How did he do that? Well, the, probably one of the most remarkable group of people I ever met and they really guided me in those years between 1997 and the year 2000 when I began, when I actually met the Dalla group in San Diego. The Bereaved, the Bereaved Families Forum is a forum, it's an organization that brings together Israeli and Palestinian families who, were, who lost loved ones to the conflict, who are bereaved. And it's Haq Frankenthal, who is the man, he's a, he's, a, he's a big, tall, Orthodox Israeli Jew who founded it. His son was kidnapped and, and, and killed by Hamas. And he came, and what happens is after there's a tragedy, he usually goes to the home and he asks, and he invites the parents to come and join. And, you know, Rami, my brother-in-law, uh, who's like a brother to me, really, I mean, I've known him since I was a kid, he, he thought he lost his mind. How dare you, how can you come into the home of, of a family who just lost a loved one and tell them, invite them to meet people from the other side? Uh, and Isaac said, you know what, just come and, just come and look. So he came and he looked, and that was all he needed to do. You see the most remarkable people, and if you've seen bereaved families, bereaved parents before, you know there's a look. When you see the look, when you see the face of bereaved parents, it's unmistakable. It's unmistakable. And these were some remarkable people who came from a place of deep pain and realized that the pain they share is the same pain the love they share for their children is the same love, and the color of our blood is all the same color, and that they can lead by example. If they can reach out, and the message is, if we can reach out and talk to the other side, then anybody can. Don't tell us that there's nobody to talk to on the other side. And Rami became a very, very, very active with the Bereaved Families Forum. He goes all over the world and, world and he speaks, and what they do is they go in pairs. You have an Israeli parent and a Palestinian parent, they go into schools and they go to synagogues and to go and they go everywhere. And um, the work that they do is remarkable and it's it's inspiring and it's probably one of the most effective organizations that bring back that bring together Israelis and Palestinians of, of, that I've ever seen. And it was it was a tremendous inspiration for me to see them go through this 
And every time I visit, I go with them to meetings, I go with them to schools, and I, and I met a great deal of people, uh, wonderful people through that. And Rami, to this day, he's part of that organization, and he does that still. Let's go back to your father, Matty, and what I believe probably was his other defining point. He was a hero, decorated hero, one of the top generals that won the war in 1967. Immediately after that, in this big jubilant time, he stands in front of the rest of the generals and he says, we need to sit down and talk to the Palestinians. We need to negotiate land for peace now. I cannot see us remaining occupiers. This will become a serious problem. He was only 45 years old. He retired at the age of 68. And I believe that pushed him to retirement in 1968 at the age of 45. What happened? Why did he do that? Well, you know, it's interesting. If you saw the, if you, if you watched the, the, the Democratic Convention, you saw, you know, there's this hysteria about Israel. I mean, there's this maniacal hysteria in America about Israel. The myth that Israel is surrounded by enemies and is there, it's being attacked all the time and it's and it's and it's being threatened all the time. It's 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 it's, it's an insanity in Israel. Okay, you can understand, but it's become an insanity in this country too, which I don't completely understand. I have to say, and that image that I talked about in the beginning of this David and Goliath of this poor small Jewish community that is always being threatened by these vicious Arabs who are just you just can't wait to kill Jews is something that's been perpetuated. And that is how Israel justifies everything it does. And that's, of course, how America justifies selling it billions and billions of you know, dollars worth of weapons. But in 1967, of course, was a watershed moment for the entire Middle East. And once again, what was the story? The story was, again, you know, the Arab armies were prepared to attack and destroy Israel. And miraculously, again, the small state was somehow able to defeat them, not only defeat them, but you know, conquer all these lands and prevail and so on and so forth. And you know, thank goodness they were they held the moral high ground and of course they're smarter. And like Mitt Romney said, it's a question of culture and all these different things. All these racist <laughs> all these all these racist notions had had, had come into play. Um, and so and this was the myth. And of course my father was a general during those that, that war. You have no idea what it means that your father was a general of 1967 in Israel. You know, uh, he walks on water. I mean, what, what, you know, he saved the world. He saved us. He saved the Jewish people. He's one of these. So this is, you know, but then, but so when I was working on the book, one of the things I decided to do was go into the Israeli Army archives, um, and who were open, and to investigate, see exactly what happened. Now, a lot of books have been written about this about this period that led to the 1967 war, what actually took place. There are books, there are documentaries, there are movies, there are, you know, endless, endless things. And I thought I read it, and I did read everything, and I thought I knew everything. So I wanted to, but I wanted to see it. And it's pretty moving when you see the transcripts of the general's meetings. You know, they have a weekly meeting at the beginning of every week. You know, it says, my, you know, General Pellet, and the things that my father said, and it's all very exciting, you know, even at my age, you know. You, but, but what they were saying was something, what I read in the, in the archives, was something I never never heard anybody mention. They were saying this, okay? Some of you, I'm sure most of you know this, okay? In the spring of 1967, uh, President Nasser decides to um, throw out the UN peacekeepers from the Sinai Peninsula, bring uh, Egyptian forces into the Sinai Peninsula, which, which violated the, the ceasefire agreement between the two countries, and he threatened to close the Straits of Tehran, which would not allow Israeli ships to go up to Elat. Well, the general said, this is a cause for war. And the government, the Israeli government, was hesitant. They thought maybe we need diplomacy. What if the Americans get mad at us? What if we do this? What if we do that? And it's very interesting. These two groups were two very different groups. The Israeli generals were about 45 years old. Most of them were born you know, in, in, in Israel, you know, in Palestine. Uh, they were all in the Pamach, the Haganah. They were this new, strong, you know, determined kind of Jew, this new Jew that was created by the Zionists. And 
And the cabinet members were older, they were in their late 60s, most of them came from Eastern Europe, they suffered in Eastern Europe from the pogroms, and they remember the Holocaust, the Holocaust you know, was only 25 years before that, and they were afraid this was going to lead to another disaster. So there was this tug of war between these two groups. There was a generational thing, but there was also uh, 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 an age thing. I mean, there was a generational thing, but there was also a, a point of view thing. Uh, you know, they had a different point of view on the world. Um, and as I read through the minutes of the meetings, my father says this, and then the other generals say this. They say, we need to attack the Egyptians now because the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. It's not prepared to attack. And they say this again and again. The Egyptian army needs at least a year and a half to two years before it, is, it will be prepared for war. The fact that the Egyptian forces came into the Sinai Peninsula make it easier for us to destroy them. We are now in a better position. Let's attack and destroy the Egyptian army. Not only do they not say it's a threat, they say it's an opportunity. They made life easier for us to destroy them. So let's get this war out of the way. We can destroy the Egyptian army again. Now, these are generals. That's how they think. And they say it over and over again. Now, I've never seen this mentioned in anything. Um, so this is an opportunity. That means there was no threat. That means this whole David and Goliath nonsense is, is really nonsense. And it was nonsense in 67 too. Anyway, in this tug of war between the, the, the generals and the cabinet, the generals, of course, won. The, the cabinet gave them the go-ahead for a preemptive strike against Egypt. The government approved a preemptive strike against Egypt. Okay, That went very quickly. Within a few days, the Egyptian army was destroyed, the Sinai Peninsula and Gaza were taken. Now the generals wanted more. They already had this momentum. These generals were young officers in 1948. They were very, they were very frustrated that in 1948 they couldn't take the West Bank. So they used this opportunity to take the West Bank and to take the Golan Heights. This was a decision that was made by the generals with Moshe Dayan, who was the defense minister. They had no approval to do this. But since it was successful, nobody, nobody did anything about it. But they actually, it was kind of a coup. Um, now, this, we go back to the myth. The myth that Israel was attacked by all these Arab, strong Arab armies who were intent to destroy it, right? In six days, what did they accomplish? The war lasted six days. In six days, they destroyed three Arab armies, occupied the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula, killed over 15,000 Arab soldiers. In six days, 15,000 soldiers were killed. 700 Israeli soldiers were killed. Who was threatening who? And they, at the end, they had the largest stockpiles of Russian-made weapons outside of Russia. This was, a, this was a massive success. But the generals had no doubt it was going to be a success. It was like shooting fish in a barrel for them. They had no doubt that this was going to be a walk in the park for them. And indeed it was. And then, when it was all over, suddenly Israel found itself in controlling another almost two million you know, Palestinians. And at the very first meeting of the general staff after the war, my father stood up and said this. He said, now we have an opportunity to resolve the Palestinian issue. Now we can allow the Palestinians to have their own state in the West Bank and Gaza. The Zionists, in principle, accepted the notion, the idea of, of partition, of parting the land into two states back in 47. They didn't like the, what was offered then, so they had the war. But now this was a much more favorable solution for the Israelis. And he said, if we don't do this now, we will become an army of occupation. That means there's going to be resistance to occupation, which means we'll have to be even more, become a very brutal uh, uh, force. This is going to destroy the moral fiber of the army, and it will destroy the moral fiber of the, of, of the Israeli society. And this he said uh, right after the war in 1967. And everybody brushed him aside. They said, ah, oh, forget it. This is not, this is not, the, Rabin actually, who was chief of staff, who was his boss, said, look, you can't talk about getting back lands now. This is not the right climate. And of course, the settlement project began immediately in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank and so on. Immediately. There was no question that this was a war of conquest. 
And he remained in the military, in, in the army, for another year, and then he retired. He, he wanted to move on to, a, to another career. He couldn't stand the atmosphere anymore anyway. So he was ready to move on. At the age of 45, your father, who was called by the Palestinians Abu Salam, means the father of peace, from 68 till 1995, when he passed away, he met several Palestinians and Arab leaders, one of them is Sam Sartawi and others. How did that play for you as a young adult, a single father, the hero of 1967, and all of a sudden shifting from being a war hero to be a peace activist? How did that shape your future and your sister and your brother-in-law and the rest of the family? Well, that, that certainly put us in a different place. When, when we became active, we came from a place where we already knew that there were, you know, the Palestinians had rights. We knew that there was a problem that could be solved. We knew that there were Palestinians with which Israel can negotiate. Um, you know, my father met with Issam Sartawi, then he met with the Yasser Arafat several times. I mean, this went on and on and on for many, many years. And what's interesting is, you, you say that they call them Abu Salam, but what's interesting is, and this is true to this day, everywhere I travel, whether it's in the, in the West Bank, or whether it's in the, in the North, in the Nazareth, in the Galilee, any place where they're, uh, where they're Palestinians, people always remember him, and people always come and tell me stories about him, things that I did not know. Some of them are in the book, some uh, are not in the book because I only hear them now. Um, and so he became relentless in saying that if Israel wants to maintain itself as a democracy and ensure its future, it has to solve the Palestinian problem. It has to allow the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza a, uh, a state, and it has to respect the rights of the Palestinians or Israeli citizens and, and, and provide them with complete equality. And this was his struggle to the day he died. I mean, this is something he fought for uh, to the day he died. I'm going to ask you two more questions, and of course, uh, I expect some questions from the audience, so I uh, want to leave some time for the audience to ask some questions. The two questions are the following. What's your opinion about the peace process in 2000 between Ehud Barak and Arafat and Clinton was broken in that? What was your, uh, your personal opinion? Was it a viable state? And uh, what happened with Sharon March to the temple? Temple Mount and how he brought down the, uh, the government of uh, Ehud Barak and the, uh, there are the, a lot of things that I'm going to invite you all to really read the book to be able to cover all this and then your opinion about one state, two state, three states, which nobody understands but the three states so if we can do that and then we'll have some questions from the audience. What's interesting about the peace process is this. Israel refused to engage in any kind of negotiation with the Palestinians until 1993. Refused, although there were plenty of opportunities. But between 1967 and 1993, the expansion of settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem was massive. In 1993, Israel knew for certain that a Palestinian state was no longer possible. And that is when they said they'd be willing to discuss, to begin a peace uh, process with the Palestinians. There was no way in the world that any Zionist government would ever allow a Palestinian state on any part of historic Palestine, historic Israel. And they refused, on the one hand, to negotiate from 1967 to 1993, they completely refused, although they had many opportunities. And at the same time, like I said, they weren't sitting idle. They were they were building, now people say settlements, sometimes people think these little farms, you know. We're talking about major cities, massive, massive cities. For Jews only, for Israelis only, on Palestinian land, which is of course what happened after 1948. This was not anything new. What happened after 1967 continued what happened after 1948, which was disenfranchising Palestinians, taking away their land, and building homes for Israelis on that land. So this was exactly the same process. Once, and they did this, and they said they did this, so that the, the occupation and the conquest of the West Bank would be irreversible. 
Israeli Prime Minister said this. Their purpose was to make the, 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 the conquest irreversible. And they succeeded. Once they knew they succeeded, they said, fine, let's talk about peace. And with that in mind, the Oslo Accords came about. And the last article my father ever wrote was called A Requiem to Oslo. This was 1995. He said, Rabin does not want peace. People thought he lost his mind. But he said, you know what? He read the Oslo Accords. He said, this was not a peace accord. This is, this is a surrender. And there's no question that it's not going to lead to peace. Of course, in the year 2000, they forced Arafat to come to Camp David. It was a joke. They came out. It was perfectly ex ex as expected. Nothing came out of, the, of, that, of that summit. And Bill Clinton uh, faulted Arafat for the fact that there was no progress. There couldn't have been any progress because there was nothing being offered. Arafat made, you know, people say, oh, the Arabs never were, are not willing to make concessions. Israel makes all these concessions. Let's think about this for a minute. What does a two-state solution mean? Now, the two-state solution is something that was formed in the 70s and 80s by Palestinians, Palestinian leaders, who were, who were encouraged by Yasser Arafat to discuss the notion of a two-state solution based on a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, which is only about 20% of historic Palestine. Palestinians gave up 80% of their homeland for peace and got nothing in return. They got settlements in return. So it's not the Palestinians that were not willing to, uh, that were not giving concessions. It was not the Palestinians. It was Israel that was not willing to make any concessions. And this was true from 1948 to this day. So Clinton comes out of Camp David and said, well, Barack gave, uh, Arafat gave some, but Barack gave more. Excuse me? Barack gave more? Barack gave nothing. Barack didn't even have a plan. They wanted Arafat to surrender, and Arafat refused to surrender. But for that, he was vilified, and of course, as we all know, he died in his office with, with uh, probably poisoned, with Israeli tanks surrounding him. So that was, the, that was the, and of course, that was the collapse of the peace process, which is not really a peace process, it was, it, was a, it was a process to try to bring the Palestinians to surrender. And of course it failed. More than even Ariel Sharon, who was a butcher and was responsible for the deaths of, 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 of countless Palestinians and Lebanese and Israelis, I think Barack is even worse. Because Barack played this game in the beginning that he was somehow willing to make peace, and then he managed to blame the failure on the Palestinians. Ariel Sharon never, 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 never pretended to want peace. He was a, a bulldog out to kill, and that's what he did, and that was his life. Barack tried to play this, this game, kind of uh, this other game, for a little while. So I think he's, he's probably even worse than, than Sharon was, um, and probably more to blame even than Sharon. But yes, uh, of course, then Sharon went up on the Temple Mount and he ignited the whole thing, and the Israeli army began shooting more, and then the Second Intifada broke out, and you know we all know what happened since then. Um, Today, when we look at the West Bank, the, well, today when we travel, I should say, all over that country, whether you call it Israel or Palestine, one thing is absolutely clear, there is no West Bank. There is no West Bank. There is no place that you can delineate and say, okay, this is the West Bank, we can have a Palestinian state here. That does no longer exist. Major, major investment Billions and billions of dollars were invested to build cities and highways and malls and schools and hospitals in the West Bank on Palestinian land for Israelis. That can never be reversed. It will never be reversed. The only option for peace, the only option for peace is a complete democracy, complete equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians within one non-Zionist state. <laughs> Just like in South Africa, they had to get rid of the apartheid system in order for there to be a democracy. They have to get rid, or we, I should say, have to get rid of the Zionist system and allow for real democracy with real elections and, you know, and, and, and a normal state uh, to come into being. This is the name of the game. Anybody that still talks about the two-state solution is either deluded or deceitful. There is no other option. 
if you have your, if you have eyes in your head, if you've been to the Middle East, if you've been to, if you've traveled around Palestine, you know there is no West Bank. There will never be a Palestinian state. And if you know anything about the state of Israel and about the Zionists who govern it, you know they will never, ever allow a Palestinian state to emerge. Never allow a Palestinian state to emerge, and will never part with any part of the land. They allow some autonomy here and there because it's convenient. But the state of Israel has developed an education system that is anti-peace, a bureaucracy that is designed to destroy the lives of Palestinians, and an army which today I think is best characterized as one of the most, one of the most well-financed, well-armed, well-trained, well-fed terrorist organizations in the world. And it's supported by this major terrorist organization is supported by tax dollars that come from here. I have a video of my father from 1992 speaking here in the U.S. where he's, he's speaking in a synagogue. And he's saying the U.S. aid to Israel is a plague. It's destroying Israel. It has made Israel corrupt. He said even more than occupying, than being an occupying force, the free money and the free weapons Israel gets from the U.S. Is, has corrupted, not just corrupting, has corrupted the state of Israel. And I think Zionism was corrupt to begin with anyway because it's a racist notion. And all racist notions are corrupt to begin with. But when we look at it today, my final chapter, the one state, two state, three state, my final chapter I call one state, two state, three state. And there's an argument between myself and my brother-in-law Rami. He still considers himself a Zionist and he believes that the Jews have a right to have their state and the Palestinians have a right to have their state and we should still work for that. And so he and I talk about this a lot and I demonstrate that in the last chapter. It's this argument between he and I. But there still are, you know, some very well-meaning Israeli activists and probably Palestinians too who still cling to that notion that we want to have our own state, we want to have our own flag, and it's perfectly legitimate. It's impossible. You can't have a Jewish state when half the population is not Jewish. Out of 10 or 11 million people, about 5.5 million are Palestinians and about 6 or 6.5 million are Israelis. You can't have a Jewish state when half the population is not Jewish. Maybe a Jewish state is a good thing, maybe Jews deserve to have a state, but it can't happen there. And rather than harp on this ridiculous notion, which is a very racist notion, we need to work together, anybody who cares, in order to end the Zionist regime and create a real democracy, a real democracy for Israelis and Palestinians.